So, so, um, so it's it's really an honor for for us to to have you, Modesto, here presenting us some pieces of of your work, and I'll try to make uh, to make your impressive CV uh, short. So, sorry for the the cottage I made. So, Modesto, after a PhD in biochemistry. You started teaching biochemistry, chemistry, and bioinformatics at the Universidad Autónoma of Barcelona. And uh, in 1990, you became group leader at the Institute of Research in Biomedicine in Barcelona. And at the same time, you also, uh, you are also directing a biotech company specialized in drug design. Um, so this is a short, <laughs> uh, some short summary of your career and your research uh, that you are focusing in uh, in, in, in Barcelona um, uh, is centered on the theoretical study of molecular recognition processes in general and the dynamic properties of macromolecules and among them the the one uh, object of study that you are uh, studying with more details is DNA. And then I will let you uh, present your work uh, entitled Exploring DNA Conformation. I'll let you okay. talk now. Okay, thank you very much. And it's, um, and thank for the invitation. I mean, it would be even better to be in person, you know, it's, um, it's uh, this type of meetings are great, but it's much, uh, much better to be to travel and to be, to have a personal touch. So I understand that you can see my presentation. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, um, it's good. Okay, yeah. okay. So this is a uh, scattering set. This is my favorite molecule. Is uh, DNA. So we study small molecules. We study proteins. But uh, you know, uh, this molecule is very close to my heart. Is 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 DNA. So really, I am interested. In, so I'm, I'm a theoretician. So I, I'm interested in DNA because of the complexity. So the the DNA is thing is is a perfect paradigm of of a multi scale system. So when you work with DNA, your basic unit measure Armstrong, so ten to the minus ten, but at the same time you want to reproduce. Um, is now okay because I have a message that yes. my microphone is too high. No, that's fine. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then, uh, at, at some point, you 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 want to understand DNA at the Armstrong level, but in others, you 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 want to understand the entire chromatin, and this is in humans is two meters. So, when you move from the very small to the very large, you need to move also in the methodology that you use if you are a theoretician. So the you know the smallest system you can work with quantum mechanics. For the medium system, you have classical. In the pixels, and you have something more in the bioinformatics uh, arena. So, if you really want want to understand all of them simultaneously, you need to play with uh, what is called multiphysics. So, it comes from a recent review, and uh, I'm, I'm I plan to do during the next uh, 40 minutes or so. I plan to make a journey with you about the type of things, the type of methodology that my group is developing in this multifixic approach to DNA. So trying to move from the very small uh, to the very large. And when you move in, into the very small, you are tackling systems that are, you know, for example, one nucleoside, something very small, uh, processes that happens in the femtoseconds, in the picosecond scale. And you are very safe in the chemical uh, area because you work with quantum mechanics. And it's a technique that we know very well, that we know is very robust. Uh, very reliable, um, but that people believe that is not cannot be applied to the field of DNA. I will show you a few examples that you can learn biology. You can learn about the biology of DNA at this level when you are interested in the very small. And I'll give you an example. This is a this is a work of Beto, and the experimental part of the work was done by my friend Phil Hollinger in, in Cambridge. And uh, I'm I'm not gonna give you, you know too many details on the project, but the main idea was to create a, a new polymerase, a polymerase that doesn't exist, that is a, a polymerase that uh, 
catalyze the formation of DNA-like polymers, but instead of DNA, you have phosphonates. Um, as you see, phosphonate, you substitute one oxygen here by a methyl or an ethyl group, an alkyl group, and the result is something that looks like DNA but has no charge. Then it's not sensitive to, uh, to nucleases. It has a really amazing biotechnological uh, properties. But from a biological point of view, it's a kind of a nightmare because uh, all the proteins we have to, to catalyze polymerization or polymerases were created to deal with an anion, with a DNA. And then, you know, the main catalytic approach is to coordinate magnesiums. And then it was a pen on the neck. How can you modify the enzyme to make it able to do the catalysis? And I'm not going to work, uh, give you the details on the side-directed mutagenesis that uh, we did. That's I, I want to just give you an idea of what was the result of our study. And this is the reaction mechanism. And this, for me, was a complete surprise. So we managed, we did the docking, we do MDs, we do blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the day, we have this reaction mechanism here. I will call your attention. This is where the action happens. And I will cut your attention on the reaction. And for me, this is really shocking. So you have here the magnesiums. These magnesiums are, ex this is the phosphonate, this is an equilibrium MD, and you see these magnesiums are exactly in the same site, in the same orientation that they should be if you uh, have uh, an anion, if you have the DNA. So look how robust is the, is the enzyme that you change completely the configuration of the substrate and it maintains exactly the same configuration site. Look at what happens when instead of running MM simulation is that you see before we run KM simulations and we try to follow the reaction. Here you have, look, this is the acceptor site. This is the phosphonate. You can see the two magnesiums coordinating. You have here the transition state. And at the end of the day, you have already the product. So at this point, we have the catalyst, the polymerization of an acyl phosphonate for the first time. And what is, I mean, if you're an expert in polymerases, what is, at least for me, was shocking is that not only the configuration is maintained, of course, this is maintaining after many mutations that were done to maintain this active configuration, but the barrier is around 7 kcal. So it means that this polymerase is as effective to catalyze the formation of phosphonate DNAs than the normal polymerase is to catalyze the formation of DNA. So this is a pure uh, synthetic biology approach where actually we create a new enzyme. In this case, not with bio interest, with biological interest itself, with biotechnological purposes, but it gives you an idea of the predictive power we have with this kind of techniques. Let me, oops, let me move to another example also in the QM uh, area, and this is a work of uh, in my group uh, Juan Aranda and uh, Monse Terrazas. Juan is the guy who did the simulations and you will see that at the end there is uh, some experimental validation that was done with, by Monse. In this case, it's something that looks like heretic. It's uh, a DNA sign. So it's a small DNA motif uh, that falls in such a way that it can bring together two pieces of RNA, not DNA, but RNA, and make a ligation. So it's a kind of, is the equivalent to a ribosome, but made with DNA. Not many people know that uh, uh, DNAs can be enzymes, but they can be enzymes. So, okay, uh, w this structure was uh, published in Nature. And then I asked Juan, when I showed the paper, okay, Juan, try to, to do a simulation and see if we can understand how these mechanisms work, because it's very, very strange. So. Uh, ligases used to be proteins. So what is the mechanism of a uh, nucleic acid ligase? And then uh, Juan uh, spent a couple of weeks before coming to my lab and say, okay, this enzyme doesn't work. I mean, this is not, uh, this is not gonna, this is not gonna work. And, and in fact, it was inactive. So I, I'm not saying that, they, as I will, you will see, I'm not saying that the 
that the nature paper was wrong, it was right, but the point is that the structure that was deposited in PDB was inactive. So the first thing that we did was to look, okay, what do you need to have a, this kind of reaction? And you immediately think, okay, you need magnesium. So we use this technique that was developed in the lab many years ago. It's a kind of boson boltzmann type of uh, method. And very quickly, it, it, it found that there is a very nice binding pocket for magnesium near where we suppose that the reaction site was. So we place magnesium there, we run molecular dynamics, you can see that actually everything looks stable. But remember, we are actually inventing. So I mean, these magnesiums were not in the crystal. So we put this to magnesiums and before running the, the quantum calculations to see the reactivity, we, we ask ourselves, okay, do we have predictive power? So if this model that remember is just a model is right, we should be able to understand why uh, this is an RNA ligase and not a DNA ligase. And you think for a while it is not, it's not so clear why, because the, uh, this is the three prime OH, this is obviously you need it for the reaction, but the two prime OH is doing nothing. So then what what you could suggest is that our model doesn't explain why it's an RNA and not a DNA ligase, because there is not a real need of two prime OH if you just look at the at the structure. But then what we did was to create this two prime OH. So, uh, sorry, we removed this two prime OH, and this is what we found. So in the case of RNA, you have a perfect defined a perfect defined uh, catalytic site. If you move to the DNA, so you remove the 2 prime OH, then you merely see that the magnesium coordination is lost and the linearity with the 3 prime OH is lost. So what it means is that you can see here what I'm meaning. Because of the sugar, the sugar packering changes from the north to the south, there is a loss of linearity and the magnesium goes to a non-catalytic site. So we have predictive power. Contrary to what I thought looking at the structure, we can understand why this enzyme is not catalytic for DNA, but is catalytic for RNA. So at this point, we decide to run uh, MMM calculation. So in this case, as is reactivity, we need a quantum part. The quantum part is what you see in the screen. The rest of the protein, as in the previous study, and the water and everything is classical. So we ran the simulations, and again, it was, I would say, a big surprise. So this is how the reaction works. Uh, you have here the two magnesiums that polarize all the system, and here are the two reaction coordinates that we found. So the first reaction coordinate is this one in which you see that the phosphate is moving from the, uh, this is GTP, so it's moving, it's liberating the PPI here. This is the, I would say, the transition state, and when it approach, there is a proton transfer. This is the second part of the reaction. You see that there is a proton transfer into the DNA side. This is what we suppose that is the reaction coordinate, and this is the activation energy, and this is fantastic because we got a rear of about uh, 24 kcals, and then we do the experiment, and it was exactly what was predicted. So it's a high barrier. It's not the most exciting catalyzer, but it's actually efficient catalyzer. So it was a great news. When, when you see these numbers, you, it means that probably your reaction mechanism is correct. Otherwise, it's very difficult to fit the value, and probably you understand how the enzyme works. But way, it works in a very similar way uh, uh, in which uh, protein ligase work. Okay, but what is the problem? The problem is if you look at this 12 kcal. So it means that this is a very difficult reaction. Even the barrier is acceptable. The, uh, the, the, the free energy difference with the reactant and products is poor. It's 12 kcal, this is too large. So then we start thinking, okay, what is happening? So if you look at the reaction and you put yourself at the end of the reaction, you see here, this is how the reaction ends. So you have a DNA here and you have a proton here. And in the other side of the molecule, you have a PPI. So this is not the final enzyme. We need to regenerate the enzyme. And when we teach biochemists, we used to explain the regeneration as a kind of side product of the reaction. In this case, the regeneration of the enzyme is a driving force of the reaction. How it happens? Okay, this is the beginning. We have this proton here. You know, a phosphate doesn't like to be protonated. So the very first thing that it does, 
and this is a barrierless reaction, is that it moves this proton to this other phosphate here, that is a uridine phosphate. It has almost the same energy, but this is not the final point. The final point is PPI. So it's you know very well known that PPI loves to be protonated, and this is something that happens spontaneously. You see, this is a small barrier, and then you have an exothermic process. At the end of the day, you have the PPI with a proton, okay? And this is actually the driving force of the reaction. The PPI doesn't like to be in the enzyme. Uh, PPI uh, diffuse to the exterior and quite impressive. I mean, we did this, in, this is a classical process. We did this through a SteerMD, but actually um, SteerMD coupled with metadynamics, but in fact, this is spontaneous. When you have PPI protonated here, if move away, and in this process, if drive away the, the magnesiums. And believe or not, when we arrive here, we recover the crystal structure of the enzyme. So the structure that is deposited in PDB is a non-active state of the enzyme that comes after the reaction happens. And this is why the magnesiums are not there. So this point, it was very, um, um, you know, it was I was very happy, but actually it was a kind of okay. Yeah, yeah. I have put two magnesiums there. What are these magnesiums really useful, or I put these magnesiums there because uh, in proteins these two magnesiums used to be there? Um, okay, then we did something very similar, very simple. So these are another kind of KMMM calculations. These are the two reaction reactant products. You see the two minima. And in this case, the two magnesiums are classical. In the previous one, the magnesiums were quantum particles. In this case, are classical for technical reasons. But, and then what we did was to uh, transform this cation into a neutron magnesium. You know, classically speaking, you just remove the two charges, but keep the magnesium there to avoid, you know, some aesthetic distortion. And you see that you don't have reaction you remove the other magnesium and clearly you don't have reaction, you don't have product. So it was very clear for me, to me, that actually these two magnesiums were crucial. And then we submit the paper to, to Nature Catalysis, and this is the editor uh, view. Okay, come on, I mean, uh, they were not magnesiums. I mean, these guys embed the position of this magnesium, place magnesiums there, but there is no any evidence that these magnesiums were there. And if the magnesiums are not there, all the reaction is crap. So, in other words, what uh, the editors say us is that, uh, as this is um, a statement for a friend of mine, Bihai Pandey, that says that, okay, in science and in life, it's bad to fall in love with models. And, and we were, I was falling in love with model. And, you know, this um, uh, DNA syme reactivity was based on a model, in a model in which I put the magnesiums in the place where my chemical intuition said that they should be and where Possum Bodman uh, tell us that was a good binding site for magnesiums, but not evidence at all. So we did experiments to validate this. And these are, this is the work of more than one year of work from Monse, by Monse and others. And the way in which you can prove that these magnesiums are there is by uh, doing, uh, in principle, simple, in reality, very complex experiment. I mean, you substitute the, the phosphate by phosphothioids. The thioid, the sulfur, doesn't like to bind magnesium. So uh, what we did was to substitute every one of these oxygens by sulfur. And as one of the referees asked, we did in the chiral way. So we specifically create the R and the S thiophosphate in each position. If our model was correct and the magnesiums were there and were important for catalysis, we should see a drop, a dramatic drop in reactivity. And this is what you found. This is the control. And here we substitute different, uh, this, all, all the oxygens that we believe were involved in catalysis and you see a dramatic reduction in the in the speed. In here is not a reduction, you just kill the enzyme. Still, you can say, okay, uh, this reduction may be due to some an specific steric collapse because the sulfur is bigger than the oxygen. So the proof that this is not the case should come by the substitution of magnesium by manganese. Manganese love to interact with sulfur while uh, magnesium doesn't like to interface with sulfur. So if you see this reduction in the speed, 
and you recover the original speed by adding manganese, there is no any other possibility than this phosphate was attached to a magnesium. And here you have, this is the control, you substitute, you start adding manganese and you see just a mild increase, is, you know, this is expected, at least it's a factor of two, at most it's a factor of two, and you see in some cases two order of magnitude increase when you actually do this type of uh, uh, substitution of or adding manganese to the reaction pot, in this case is 10 millimolar of manganese versus 80 millimolar of magnesium, and you see a boost of one up to two orders of magnitude. And this is only explanation of this result is that we were correct and that actually these magnesiums were there. They were crucial for catalysis. They were coordinating the expected, um, the expected phosphate. As an additional proof, we did this, uh, you know, order reaction. We expect two catalytic magnesium. You should expect, you should expect a reaction order of two. This is exactly what you get. And finally, if you are really, uh, if you really want to find problems, you can say, okay, you have not proved that there is a proton transfer at the end of the day. And here I prove you that it was a proton transfer and we did this by kinetic isotopic effect. So at the end of the day, we proved that the reaction was right. But I think that will prove something else is that we can understand how enzymes work, uh, DNA or nucleic acid enzymes work, and that we can, using quantum mechanics, get real detailed information on something very specific. So I, I think I have convinced you that working at this level, combining classical and quantum mechanics, you can learn a lot about DNA, but in many other cases, you really don't want to, to go to this specific detail, and you prefer to play with this level of uh, of resolution to the, I would say, the classical X-ray NMR uh, definition of, of DNA, so something with 10, 20, 100 base pairs. In this case, we cannot use quantum, but we can use classical. And classical means force field. And this is, um, you know, the, the work of Ivan, Ivani, and many other students and people in the group. Uh, for us, was more than six years of work. We are close to drive a new phosphor. In this case, it will be after eight years of work. You know, it's a lot of a lot of work. The fossil was open one year, uh, so the community was using one year before we publish, um, and it was very extensively tested. I think is right now it is the gold standard in nucleic acid simulation. So, I'm not gonna, you know, explain to you. Uh, what a nightmare is to develop a fossil, um, and I'm not going to explain you all the, the studies we made. Yes, this is the you know the the, the take home message. What uh, for me is the most important point to convince you is that despite in the past uh, MD was not very powerful in nucleic acids, now it has predictive power. So you can make predictions that you can test, and you know um, there are uh, many examples here from you know very um, basic things about uh, DNA uh, physical properties to uh, DNA in a given environment, reactivity of DNA, or DNA in chromatin, nucleosomes, etc. Uh, I'll give you just two examples, uh, both of them very, very recent. I'm especially proud of both. Uh, this is the first is the work of uh, Fede in the group and, and many other people actually. And it shows the power that you have when running uh, classical simulation. In this case, it was in colibactin. Colibactin is a toxin that is uh, generated by uh, bacteria that are in the in the stomach and in the you know in the colon. And uh, apparently, well, apparently, it's clearly related to uh, colon cancer, colorectal cancer. And then our colleagues were exploring this uh, this uh, this toxin, and it was very clear that this toxin actually recognized the DNA and cross-linked with the DNA. And at the end of the day, it generates gaps in the RNA in the DNA, which are the responsible for oncogenic lesions. The point that was not clear is what are the sequence preferences of this of this uh, molecule. So what we did was to uh, think that our Molecular dynamic simulations can reproduce properties of DNA, and with these properties of DNA, we can guess what are the different sequences, those that are so different that uh, should make DNA 
uh, uh, very easy to be recognized by this colibactin. And you can see here, these are different uh, descriptors uh, derived from MD. And you can see here this sequence that are obviously very different to the rest. These are exactly those that our experimental colleagues form were the targets for mutation induced by this, um, by this uh, toxin. This is another word that I, I wish just to comment, just to show the predictive power, because none of these were obvious conclusions. Just looking at the, at the experiment, this is another word. This is done by Antonia, another postdoc in the lab. And here it was, a, it starts as a kind of side product of the fossil development. And what we did here, what we were interested here was to see whether or not we'll be able to recognize a crystal. So the idea is that, okay, you have, um, you run them these simulations of DNA and you reproduce the crystal structure of DNA. But the point was not to reproduce the crystal structure, but to reproduce the crystal. Whether today in these simulations are able to reproduce a crystal stable on time. So we start with uh, the Rudecus of the Decamor, that is the usual guinea peak for this type of systems, and then look at PDB. And in PDB, it appears in three different crystal lattices. So we simulate the three of them. Our systems that are large, in some cases, are over one million atoms, because here we don't simulate a single DNA. We simulate an ensemble of DNA in crystal symmetry. It's a kind of very complicated simulation. You need to add, uh, you know, magnesiums. You need to add water. It's difficult. But at the end of the day, we run the simulation. And what you, said, you show here, in this case, I don't know, you have um, 20, 30, 40 molecules. I don't know. But you see that really nothing happens. This is the RMSD with respect to the X, Y, uh, e, uh, X, Y, X, Z, and Y, Z. Z is the axis of the DNA. Okay, when in this case you see that nothing happens, what you have dot here is the RMSD of the, of the, of, of one of, of every one of the of the oligos, and this is the oscillation, is the shadow that you have. So here you find that nothing happens. So you are reproducing the crystal. What in the contrary, in these two other cases, while in the X, Y plane, everything is fine. When you move to the Z plane, the crystal is lost. So there are, the, the DNA is not being destroyed. It's just there is slipping. So the DNA, one strand of the DNA move apart to the other strand of the DNA, and you break the crystal. Why? So the first option is that the fossil is wrong. So you don't have a stable crystal here. The most, the obvious suspect will be the fossil. But if it was the fossil, then why in this case you have the crystal stable? If the fossil is wrong, it should be wrong always. And this is not the case. Then we did something. What we did was something very revolutionary. We take a look to the papers. And what we found was very interesting. We found that in this case, I mean, there is some, you know, a cacodylate, there is a bunch of, of things there that is the same in all the cases. But in this case, the crystal was obtained without the spermine. While in these other two cases, the crystal was obtained in the presence of a spermine. And as a spermine is not visible in the crystal, the crystallographers thought that the spermine is doing nothing. But this is not true. So this is the same plot as before, but it put just in one axis. And what you have here, this line here is the control simulation, is that I showed you before for this crystal lattice here at the bottom. And these two other simulations are the original ones that I showed you before. So this is a projection in the z-axis of the RMSD. So the slippery of one is strand over the other. And this is what happened when you add the spermine. You see that when you add the spermine, these other two crystal lattices are actually converging exactly to the same crystal structure that it was in the PDB. So the take home message is that actually uh, this in principle innocuous spermine was actually the responsible, not of the DNA structure, but of the DNA crystal. And this is opening, and it's something that we are exploring right now, is opening new ways in, in terms of phase separation, the role of ions in the condensation of DNA, etc. Because the spermine, that you can see here, spermine is not visible in the crystal because it's sliding continuously, it's very mobile, uh, probably not too different what is happening with some uh, histone tails. Anyway, what's next?
So fossil has now predictive power. Where are we going now? Uh, clearly, we are going to to solve the problems that are still there. I'm, I don't have time to go into much detail, but now all the forces, for example, are not good in representing stacking. This is uh, this is a simulation of, I think, is a, a hundred millimolar uridine solution. And you see that there is an aggregation in the simulation, and this is a tube of uridine, one molar. There is no aggregation. So this is wrong. And this is wrong because, you know, all the forces over stabilize stacking, this is approved by NMR that, uh, you know, the, there is less stacking than it is uh, predicted by all fossils, and we are correcting that. So this is the way in which we are approaching this is using uh, machine learning. So we are different, different type of machine learning and using right now in the order of 300,000 uh, quantum mechanical calculations for fitting. And um, I hope in uh, not too distant future we'll be able to offer uh, this uh, revised force field based on a different technology uh, to the community. But I don't want to go more in details on force field because I'm sure you, you already know um, uh, quite a lot about uh, force fields, uh, force field for DNA, force fields for RNA. Uh, let me ask myself, okay, that's fantastic, but we are studying the biggest system you can simulate considering water is in the order of 1 million, 1.5 million atoms. So it means a few dozens of nucleotides. So remember our objective was to go to the bigger system. We want to ideally model in the genome, but at the base pair resolution. So we are going to move, we should move from this uh, place here where we are still very confident because our uh, molecules that we can understand, that we can look at the atomistic level, we want to go to this other level where we want to introduce anti, we want to reproduce anti-chromatin. And this means, again, to develop technology. And this is mainly the work of Jürgen Walter, a very talented student in, in, the, in the group. And what he did was to develop ideas that were first suggested by Wilma Olson, Victor Thurkin, then by, you know, the Philip Lankas, the ABC Consortio, etc., etc. So the idea is that uh, instead of representing DNA at the single atom level, it may be enough to represent in the helicoidal space. So instead of looking at all the degrees of freedom, we can perhaps just look at how the base pair, the base pairs are oriented one with respect to the neighboring one. So then you reduce the problem to, um, you know, just three rotations and three translations. And if you do this, uh, you can apply harmonic or pseudo harmonic models. This is a pseudo harmonic model that we developed that is inspired in empirical balance bond theory. Uh, it's a um, basic statistical mechanics equations. And in reality, you assume that you have uh, several harmonic models that are combined. So at the end of the day, you can actually uh, take MD simulations, fit the covariance matrix, get this uh, covariance matrix in the helical space, and from this point, you just uh, do uh, apply Einstein equation and go to stiffness parameters from which you uh, can actually uh, explore the flexibility of DNA using, for example, Monte Carlo. So I don't go to go to the, to the details, but this is the type of multimodal expansion that we found for certain steps. And this is the way in which we can reco recover this, um, this multi-normal. These are tricks we do, we apply to reconstitute from the helicoidal space to reconstitute all atomistic detail. It is very, very precise. And this is the quality you get. So I'm, again, I don't want to go to much detail, but this is uh, when you see two lines, one line is MD and the other is our method. And you will find difficulties to, to, to differentiate between one and the other. Uh, this is dot product that say how similar is the trajectory that you get from our approach, our Monte Carlo uh, mesoscopic model with respect to the MD. In ideal work, you should have one in the diagonal. Uh, zero outside the diagonal, and you find something, you know, that uh, it's actually very, very, very close. This is the details. If you go at, at a given, um, if you go to a, to a, to details at a given base pair, these are cases of base steps that are very complex. So this is a TA surrounded by a CG. Uh, you see that is a multimodal, 
actually a highly correlated multimodal system, and this is the result of, I don't know if this is MD, and this is Monte Carlo or in the reverse. In any case, you can see that this actually reproduce uh, perfectly. So you, you not only get a good agreement in terms of the overall movement of DNA, you, you get also very good representations in terms of the uh, detailed structure of DNA and, uh, you know, the, the the efficiency that you obtain. Remember here, we are talking about an RMSD per base pair in the order of point something Armstrong, and the efficiency of these calculations are, uh, you know, typically three, four orders of magnitude when we can measure, because there is a point where you cannot run the simulation by MD because it's too expensive. So at least we promise 10,000 more, 10,000 more efficiency than MD. Okay, the, the method is, is fantastic in the sense that you can add many more things. For example, you can add a D vehicle, you can add a Barnabas potential, and actually you can sample using, you know, a, a more complex energy, and this fits perfectly to chromatin. Because what you can do is to use this model to trace the flexibility of the linkers, and then consider that the nucleosome on particle is something, you know, very simple, can be just a cylinder, of a positive uh, ball uh, that is rigid in your simulation, and then you just fit the parameters of the of the nucleosome by fitting experimental results. For example, you know the sedimentation coefficient. We also use uh, SACS spectra. You can use uh, you know the different microscopy images. So you can use many. Um, many different methods to actually calibrate what are the parameters for the DNA. You already have it, but the parameters for, for the nucleosomes. Okay, once you have there, you are able to simulate long pieces of chromatin, and you can start playing with things that are closer to biology. For example, we have been working many years in trying to understand the maps of, uh, of the nucleosome maps. So the maps that you get when you treat, uh, this is your sample, this, for example, then you treat you treat with uh, micrococal nuclease, you digest, and then you find where are the nucleosomes, right? Um, and then you find, uh, and this is, in, in my opinion, is probably the, the best method available that is called nuclear, that actually at the end of the day, you have uh, peeling, uh, peak calling, so you have nucleosomes position here. And then you have this, uh, uh, you know, these images, and you tend to believe that you know where the nucleosomes are, but if you look at the real experimental number, these are the experimental reads, you see that perhaps here it is okay, but here, hmm, and in here it's very, very complicated. And actually, if you do a look, uh, you know, the analysis a little bit with detail, you find these are the, the nucleosome peak callings. For example, here you have a nucleosome, here you have a nucleosome, but for example, here you have nucleosomes that are overlapping. And what it means is that these nucleosomes are probably corresponding to different cells. So you can think that you have a nucleosome architecture where the nucleosome is here, for example, and, and, and then perhaps the second one is here, and other in which they are in these two other positions. So that you are detecting as an MNA sec map is actually a combination. And it turns very clear because when you try to reconstitute this in our method, the 3D structure of this nucleus in fiber, you found that there are big collisions. So this is not possible. You need to decompute the system and consider that the map that you are getting is not the map of a single cell, that you are getting is an average of many cells. And then you need to um, be aware that you may rebuild an average map, but this average nucleosome map may be completely unrealistic. It may not correspond to any cell in your sample. So we develop a method to deconvolute the signal. The idea is very simple. We try to explain the global digestion map as the minimum amount of populations. And then we, is a kind of grand canonical uh, type of study, but in, in short, what you did is you define what is the minimum number of families where we can put nucleosomes, which makes sense in a physical point of view when we reconstitute the FAPA, and that combine it, they reproduce the experimental profile. This is the idea of the method. And of course, then you reconstitute for a segment, then you have to overlap with other segments in such a way that the end families uh, reduces because they are not compatible with the end prime 
families here and at the end of the day you have or you can reconstitute big fibers big segments with hundreds of nucleosomes of course at the end you need to validate experimentally and this means that of course you have the mna sake data then you reconstitute with the physics this then you both man weight these different families and at the end of the day you select you check by micro C, which of these families are compatible with experimental results. So it's a little bit complicated uh, process, but I will show you in a second that it works pretty well. And at this point, I, I, I'm moving. I'm moving from the nucleosome to the nucleosome fiber and to something bigger. And it means that they need to introduce other restraints. So micro C is great for the very local, it gives you contacts in 100 to 100 base per level but if you need to to reconstitute entire chromatin fibers you need to use all the strains in this case we use mostly high c i think you are familiar with high c already the idea is that you you, you detect those places where two segments of dna that may be distance in the space are actually quite maybe distance in the sequence are in reality close in the space so these are experiments that we do in the lab and we have developed actually is i say we is mostly the work of diana a very talented uh, student um, the idea is that okay you first start with this kind of uh, high c maps of, and we transform these high c contacts in a kind of uh, distant restraints or time average distant restraints that we implement at the end of the day into Brownian dynamics to get uh, 3D structures. Of course, um, I'm going very fast to the technology, but what uh, we do instead, in addition to adding high C restraints, we also add many other restraints. For example, uh, the shape and the volume of the nuclei, all the information that we have, for example, on telomer thermal distance, on this information that we'll show you in a second, it comes from ultra resolution storm ultra resolution fluorescence uh, um, data so the, the 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 framework that we are developing and this is the word of isabel um, juanpa uh, pablo um, <coughs> sorry, rafa diana and pablo is a lot of people in the group developing methodology here is trying to integrate everything of course at the very end it's going to be uh, your models so it's going to be a physical model but uh, we have to integrate all experimental data that is run and this is an example um, um, i think it, it will appear uh, soon but this is an example of the level of resolution we can achieve in the real system this is uh, uh, here the 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 experiments were done at home, uh, but except the, the microscopy, microscopy came from storm. These wonderful storm images were taken by Pia and were analyzed by uh, mostly by Pablo and uh, Jurgen and the other Pablo. So at the end of the day, what we have is MNA seg map. We have micro, um, we have high C maps that you can see here. We focus in two genes that are related to pluripotency and. Uh, we have this uh, stain uh, anti-H3 that give us where the nucleosomes are. Then we combine this information, this 3D information on the where the nucleosomes are with MNSEC, with our physical model. And at the end of the day, this is the type of resolution we have. It's truly based per resolution. And in this particular case, we validate that this is right by storm, by uh, you know tracing using is a it's a vari variation of storm that is called oligo painting so we paint these two genes and we know that actually the the 3d models that we that we build remember this is base per resolution is actually in full agreement with the experimental position based on microscopy and i'll give you i'm going to finish with one example of how all this can be integrated in a given problem and this is a, a paper that will will appear probably in the next weeks uh, is the impact of epigenetics in chromatin structure and everything starts with the small and the small was a very basic word done by alberto many years ago that he takes a, a, a piece of dna and then look at uh, you know a gc step and in the same tetramer environment a cg step and what you see this is a heat map and this is i don't know this is roll this is twist this is rise and what you see is that actually in here you see a lot of uh, yellow and green that means that it's not very hot it means that it's a very 
um, you know, uh, very diffuse distribution. So it means that this is very flexible. CG steps are very flexible. On the contrary, GC steps are very rigid. What happens when you methylate a, CP, a CPG step? It becomes very rigid. And this was a, a suggestion that actually give us to suggest that uh, it will actually make more difficult to, to, to make a circle that will uh, make very difficult to, to structure in nucleosomes. And this is indeed what, uh, this is the work of EM that will make uh, nucleosome formation more difficult. And this is the, the this is the prediction and this is the experiment. So I don't have time to, to go into detail, but this is the, uh, the amount of, of nucleosomes that you are able to reconstitute. And as much as you methylate it, you actually reduce the amount of nucleosomes that you can make. It is no question on that. Um, this is a triplicate, so it's the same experiment done three times. So uh, at this time, I was very confident that uh, our results were correct, so we tried to publish. And this is what uh, we thought, because um, at that point, it was a paper. I mean, our message was very clear. If you methylate, you have less nucleosomes. And it was a paper actually in Nature saying just the opposite. So, I mean, no way to try to fight with some in vitro and in silico data to fight a Nature paper. Uh, so we just put the results in, you know, in, in the pile until we were able to do some experiment ourselves. And, and, and this experiment was done mostly by Isabel and was to create a model. So when the data in the Nature paper were in human, but perhaps in human there are other things rather than the effect of methylation. We create, we create a, a mammal-like GIS. So we create a model. A model that is GIS, GIS doesn't have anything that recognizes methylation. So it's purely uh, unable to distinguish if it, there is a methyl or not. It doesn't have methyl DNA binding protein, has nothing. It doesn't have methylases, it doesn't have demethylases. Then what we did was to take GIS and we transfect with uh, several methylases, with all the methylases, I think were from, from mouse, I believe. And these are the experiments showing that, okay, believe me, we transfect efficiently these methylases and we found that methylation is uh, happening. We proved by different techniques, by HPLC, by uh, bisulfide, by uh, nanopore. It's clear that our DNA was heavily or significantly methylated and actually the cell was viable, which is quite surprising because uh, GIST doesn't like to have methyls in the DNA, but actually you can make a GIST model with uh, methylated DNA. And the cell has some problems. You can see here, I'm not an expert, but even myself, I can detect that there are some problems in division, uh, you know, the, but the cell can stay for, for a long period. Okay, so then we have a sample. And we have a sample where we can induce methylation. So we can compare the, you know, the positions of nucleosomes, for example, before and after methylation. And um, something that I expect at the beginning, you know, if there is no me methylation machinery in this, you could expect that methylation will be random. And that every time we do an experiment, the methyls will be placed in a different place. It's not random. So these are uh, different um, uh, replicas, and you can see that the methylation happened exactly in the same places. This is a correlation between two experiments. You see that is absolutely concerned. And we were able to knock down every one of the methylases, and then you see that you have less or more methylation level, but the positions are quite well conserved. And quite amazing. So if there is nothing recognizing methylation, if there is not a methylation machinery uh, in place with something directing the methylases to the proper site, you will expect actually that methylation will be a little bit spread everywhere, but you can see that it's not. So in here, you have, this is a transcription on the star side, you have very little methylation. And on the contrary, when you move into the, the gene body, you increase dramatically the methylation. And this is exactly the same if you correct by CPG context. So this is a very robust. So for reasons we don't know, actually the methylation pattern in GIST, that is a system, it's a synthetic system, matches that in mammals. And even matches, and I honestly have no idea of why, but it maps the well-known anti-correlation between H3K4 methylation marks and 
the methylation level. Very curious. Remember, is this, there is nothing for methylation, but let me go to the question we wanna answer. Is methylation correlated or anti-correlated with nucleosomes? Remember, our in silico data suggests it's anti-correlation. The experiments by others suggest that it's correlated. Here is no question, it's anti-correlated. You can see here, these are the, the, the nucleosomes that we determine for the same samples. And you can see here, this is this is integrated for the, for the entire data. Zero means that uh, you have here a well-positioned nucleosome. If you have a well-positioned nucleosome, you don't have methylation. If you're in the linker, you have methylation. If you have a nucleosome here, you don't have methylation. So it's very clear that we were right and that specifically methylation increases the stiffness, as it increases the stiffness, it makes a nucleosome less prone to be placed there. Nucleosomes are actually moving. And you can see that actually this is the case in a few genes that we have follow. I don't have time to go into details, but you can see the, the, the nucleosome rearrangement. This is before and after methylation induction, and you can see that there is a, a shift in methylation that is very, very evident in those genes that change function, that change activity during uh, the effect. Sorry. So what is the impact of methylation out of the nucleosome? I mean, we did this by, uh, this is the work of Isabel and, and Diana. We did this by high C. I mean, I'm sorry, this uh, high C are not very informative because are all the, all the chromosomes here. But you can see that globally there are no dramatic effects. But if you go and analyze chromosome by chromosome in the unmethylated sample and the methylated sample, there is a major rearrangement. Actually, you go to the details, you know, um, and you always see the same. Methylation increases the cis context and decreases trans context. So the DNA becomes, when you methylate, the DNA becomes locally um, more, com more compact. And because it's locally more compact, the long-term contacts disappear. And the final um, picture is you have a more condensed chromatin that actually will have, in general, of course, every gene is a different, but in general, we have less activity and uh, let me finish my journey i mean i am running out of time i move from the very small to the very large to move back to the very small and it remains reminds me a lot um, you know this this guy you know this uh, georgi antony uh, game of game of is a physicist he was you know uh, he was uh, a really fascinating person he um, he created i mean he He's a he was a theoretical, theoretical physicist. He was in Cambridge during the discovery of DNA, he was a personal friend of, of Watson and Crick. And actually he did an impressive work in, in diffusion of science, in making dissemination of science. I mean, he, he wrote in the, in the local newspaper in Cambridge, uh, a kind of, uh, it was a kind of a comic, was the adventure of Mr. Topkins. Uh, so Mr. Top Topkins uh, was a kind of, um, uh, he was working in a bank, was not a very clever man, but uh, he was completely uninterested about physics. And, but he fell in love with the, with the daughter of the professor of physics and, at, at Cambridge. And then just to, you know, to try to progress, you know, uh, he attended to the classes of his uh, father-in-law, you know, and then uh, he, he, he listened to relativity, to quantum physics and so on, and then he fell asleep. And when he falls asleep, when he sleep, I mean, he dreams. And when he dreams, he dreams in, in, uh, in uh, different worlds. With I don't know, the Planck constant will be different, or the speed of light will be different. And then it, it was a way in which uh, Mister, uh, in which Gamow uh, tried to learn physics and uh, to the to the English, to the non-educated English people. And and in this book, I mean, that collects all this history, all these stories. Uh, he finished with uh, some. Uh, I would say some thoughts of Mr. Topkins. I mean, he concludes that the attempts of human mind to understand everything around us, being giant stellar galaxies, so it means uh, big chromatin fibers, microscopic bacteria, so it means uh, long pieces of DNA or elementary particles, let's say base pairs, is the essence of science. And this is interested, and this is what, what we are doing. So, um, 
just my last slide to to comment that what I explained you today is not really my work it's the work of uh, many people in the group for actually many years this is a recent picture of the of the group but uh, I have already show you the people that was involved uh, in some cases uh, many years before this photo was taken so yes uh, thanks there for their work and thank you for your kind attention i will be very happy to uh, to answer or to try to answer any question thank you thank you Modesto. um so for people to who would like to ask question then they have to to, have, uh, to mention it and to activate the, the the hand and then i will give them the right talk i haven't chosen this way to do but that's the way to do so okay yes. you see my you see my face now you don't see the screen yes okay fantastic so i don't know if anybody uh, Want to start? Then I will. I will start in, in the meanwhile. Um, so yeah, so I, 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 it's of course extremely impressive. And I, I was wondering, uh, in your simulation, can you uh, or do you take into account the environment uh, of chromatin inside the cells? I mean, there might exist heterogeneity about the environment of chromatin. Yes. Uh, this is a very good point no i mean in these simulations i told you what uh, you know the i mean yes we have a de vehicle type thing but um, and of course you have the pieces of chromatin there but um, it's monte carlo so we don't have um, we don't account for example of what are uh, you know different phases that can happen and different uh, we don't have transcription factors we don't have uh, anything around you know and uh, for us uh, the, the the environment is is the same so we don't have in principle it should be possible but right now we have not implemented a way to distinguish between different uh, compartments or different uh, phases of of chromatin we are working now in a method that will be based in the brownian dynamics rather than in monte carlo for sampling and with this method for example we are able to uh, for example follow the diffusion of transition factors in the chromatin and in principle we should be able to um, uh, to tackle to different uh, uh, to different uh, phases right now the only the only way in which we introduce is that we have all the chromatin environment in the given vicinities but we don't have anything out of the out of the chromatin But still, it, it, you have already a lot of uh, result without it. So, it's, yeah. It's yeah, yeah. So the point is that, yeah, I mean, the, you 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 know, with commenting, you know what is um, uh, what is happening with DNA. That is the information you have. But there is many other things there. I mean, we don't know where the the RNA, for example. We know that there are tons of RNA, but whether yeah. we don't know where to put the RNA. Yeah. And and so. So I don't know if I, I, I'll let anybody who would like to ask, to ask question just to, to tell me and I'll activate. But, yeah. so, but, so then I will just add another, another question, maybe. Um, so you, you mentioned at some point the fact that uh, for the, the, um, you could have a parallel between the histone tails and the, the roles of ions in DNA condensation. Yes. So just could you tell us a little bit? Yeah, so we have done, I mean, this is mostly done with uh, Rosanna Colepardo, that was a was a postdoc in my group and now is a lecturer in Cambridge. I mean, we have been studying different tales, histone tales, um, H3, quite a lot of uh, H3 and H4. Um, and what you see is that actually, depending on the epigenetic state, they can actually interact with, the, with DNA uh, from even another uh, nucleosome, so they are these tails depending on the whether they are methylated or or not. Even if they are acetylated, they are able to reach and condensate the the DNA. So we are running. Uh, we have done quite a lot of simulations with uh, amino acids as a models, 
also with uh, nucleosomes in fibers. And there is a couple of recent papers in PNAS and nucleic acid research showing that this is indeed the case, that these uh, histone tails are actually kind of of uh, IDP uh, polypeptide uh, charge system that can actually uh, help to uh, to condense uh, DNA and that perhaps I don't know that perhaps a significant part of this um, phase uh, separation of part of chromatin is is related to the histone tail. So the problem is that I mean we are getting data from NMR about how these tails are depending whether they are methylated, unmethylated, they are uh, acetylated or uh, they are phosphorylated. But uh, as these are IDPs from, you know, the data you, you have is um, is quite poor and the ability of fossil to deal with IDPs is not brilliant. So, yeah. but yes, the answer is that histones are, histone tails are, that for many years were ignored are actually very, 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 very informative on the structure of chromatin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, to, to, so uh, uh, it seems that nobody wants to take or to ask questions. So I'll just have a last one uh, about the, the GE quadruplex that you have worked on and, uh, and also the, the importance of, it seems that the loop that are formed uh, may play an important role in the stability of this non-B DNA structure? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. But, uh, so, do you have, I, I haven't really read any, any anything on, on drug targeting this loop. No, no, I mean, uh, I, I haven't done so. The, the last thing we did on, on loops of quadruplex was a, a paper with uh, Michele Vendruscolo of Cambridge and that uh, and there, what we explored was the power of combining molecular dynamics with NMR strains to really get high resolution of the loops because are are very mobile and you know the force field is not fantastic. Current force fields are not fantastic for single stranded uh, configurations. I I haven't I I haven't done a match on on uh, on drug binding but i know there is people i mean tom Cheatham and others that are doing really uh, impressive work in um, unsupervised binding so just uh, running massive simulations and and um, uh, and getting you know uh, for example the stack configurations in the in the loop so we haven't done much on this okay well th thank you very much um, a pleasure we will stop here and thank you for, for people who came to listen to you. And I think that we may have the opportunity to listen to you after. Sure, too. Sure. I will be delighted to visit the Institute and, you know, have a yeah. proper beer and everything. That <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.